We're talking about fundamentalism. We start then with a little bit of background, and this is going to be review of things that we have already discussed. The Great Awakening going back to the early 1700s, and you can see some of the individuals whom we discussed in the context of that Great Awakening, which again, what we emphasized there was the fact that the Great Awakening was, like the Reformation, a revival in which the Word of God was simply and faithfully proclaimed, and then God was the one who was doing that work of revival. So Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, George Whitfield, some of the great names of the first great awakening. Then there was a time of some decline in terms of spiritual enthusiasm and interest in the American colonies, especially surrounding the American Revolutionary War. But it was not long after the American Revolution that once again we begin to have this renewed interest in spiritual things and there is another revival. And this is the Second Great Awakening. And it was longer and broader in its scope than the First Great Awakening. It involved the three major American denominations, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and the Methodists, the Methodists in particular, grew exponentially during the Second Great Awakening. You'll see I've given a 50-year span for the Second Great Awakening there. Probably more precise would be to go from 1800 to about 1830, but there was some build-up to it in the 1790s with John McMillan and others, and there was certainly some uh, after-effects in the 1830s and even early 1840s of the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening had massive impact in terms of, really in terms of its effect on American Christianity. And we saw some of those good effects when we talked about the modern missions movement. And we'll even see some of the good effects today when we talk about some of the great preachers and evangelists who came out of the Second Great Awakening. It even had a good moralizing effect on American culture. We talked about that a little bit last time. There were some good parachurch organizations that were started in the, really, in the uh, shadow of the Second Great Awakening. Things like course, the American Bible Society, the American Board for Foreign Missions, we talked a little bit about those, but also things like the Goodwill Organization, the Salvation Army, these organizations that were set up to help people and to meet needs in society at a time in American history when we don't have the government stepping in, there is no Social Security, there is no Medicare and those kinds of things yet, and so the church is taking it upon itself to meet some of the needs in the culture. And we talked last time about how sometimes that can be a dangerous thing if it becomes the primary focus of the church, because that's not the church's primary focus. But it is, I believe, a legitimate secondary emphasis, as long as we remember that the proclaiming and preaching of the gospel and the fulfilling of the Great Commission is our primary focus as Christians in this world. Speaking of some of those names associated with the Second Great Awakening, Lyman Beecher, Asahel Nettleton and Charles Finney, and uh, we talked about each of those individuals some more briefly than others, but these were some of the Presbyterians in particular in New England who were influenced by the Second Great Awakening. And it was Charles Finney who really sort of took some of the things that were happening on the frontiers in Methodist camp meetings, and he formalized those, I suppose, turned them into a strategy whereby he said these new measures could create and manipulate revival. And so Finney represents perhaps the first inroads of real unashamed pragmatism into American Christianity, such that after this point, people are going to start thinking of success in ministry in terms of numeric results, in terms of numbers, rather than just in terms of ministry faithfulness. And Finney's new measures, he believed, could manipulate and create those kinds of numbers and could create results in a more decisionistic approach to evangelism and revival rather than the fruit-filled life that Jonathan Edwards and others had emphasized during the First Great Awakening. We've talked about all of that, so we don't need to rehearse it much except to just give you a little bit of background. 
Some of the even worse byproducts of the Second Great Awakening are seen in the Restorationist movement. The Restorationist movement took really the spiritual momentum and enthusiasm of the true revival and then used it as a platform to promote false ideas. And so we have the original architects of the Restorationist movement, Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone, who start the Church of Christ, and then out of the Church of Christ, Joseph Smith, a false prophet, starts the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, and we have the birth of Mormonism. And then we have Mary Baker Eddy and the birth of Christian science. Really, uh, if Joseph Smith's a kind of a resurgence of certain aspects of ancient Gnosticism, Christian science also uh, a resurgence of Docetism and certain aspects of Gnostic, ancient Gnostic false teaching. Ellen G. White in the Seventh Day Adventists, we talked about that. Charles Taze Russell and the Jehovah's Witnesses, we talked about that briefly. Really a resurgence of ancient Arianism. And then even within this restorationist movement paradigm, which again is an attempt to get back to the early church and bypass church history, we even have the birth of Pentecostalism in the early 20th century. And we just briefly touched on that last time. But again, this is an... This is an attempt to try and re, um, recreate the apostolic church. That's essentially what Pentecostalism tries to do. And so if they had miracles in the first century church, we need to have miracles today. And if they spoke in tongues, we need to speak in tongues. And if they had the gift of healing, we need to have the gift of healing. So you can see how that restorationist paradigm pervades even Pentecostalism. Good byproducts. Uh, There are some mid to late 19th century preachers and evangelists who we really haven't talked about much in this class, but who are going to be very familiar to you. Of course, one of the good byproducts is the modern missions movement, and we talked about some of those modern missionaries, going back to William Carey, Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor, and others. But among some of the more well-known pastors and evangelists of this time period, certainly Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody, and Billy Sunday, and there's others in the class notes that we're not going to have time to survey, but these three we'll just take a brief look at. First, Charles Spurgeon. Of course, you're all familiar with Spurgeon, and so we won't take much time to delve into his entire career uh, as a minister, a faithful minister there in England. He was a particular Baptist, and in fact, it's, it's interesting that today Spurgeon is beloved by so many different denominations, including many outright Arminian denominations today. What they often don't realize is that Spurgeon himself was a very committed Calvinist, and as very strong in his Calvinistic, Reformed, Baptist theology. During his lifetime, it's estimated that he preached to over 10 million people, and he often preached up to 10 times a week. He preached in the Metropolitan Tabernacle there in London, Uh, The congregation was originally at uh, the new Park Street Chapel, and then they outgrew that building, and so they moved. And he was the pastor of that congregation for 38 years. The Metropolitan Tabernacle could hold up to 5,000 people, with another 1,000 people standing. And so this was a massive building, and Spurgeon preached there every week. And you can go down to our library. His sermons were published in the local newspapers there in London. You can go down to our library and you can look at all 38 volumes of Spurgeon's sermons, which are a massive encyclopedia of really a treasure trove of good preaching. Uh, Spurgeon's preaching style may be a little different than what we emphasize here at TMS. I think different in the sense that it was more of him choosing a passage and then just kind of launching, uh, but yet his it was suited to his particular giftedness and his really brilliance as a preacher. And um, some of the gems that he has in his sermons, Spurgeon is one of the most quotable 
preachers from church history, and you guys, you guys are, are well aware of that. Uh, Spurgeon did edit his sermons. In fact, Dr. MacArthur talked about that in a recent Q&A here in chapel. Spurgeon did edit his sermons after he preached them and before they were published. So, um, not to take away from his genius, but you do have to recognize that when you read the sermon, that's not the pure extemporaneous exposition. It has been slightly edited and things have been sharpened a little bit before they were printed. Uh, at the end of Spurgeon's life, and this is something we're going to see in this lecture as we talk about the fundamentalist movement, at the end of Spurgeon's life, liberalism was starting to gain massive inroads in the church in England, just as it was in the church in America, not the church of England, the church in England. We're talking not about the Anglican church, though that certainly had gone liberal, but about the Baptist Union, and Spurgeon found his denomination going liberal, and when he stood up and tried to defend conservative, biblical Christian theology in that context, he found himself ostracized and eventually kicked out of his denomination. So the largest church in the Baptist Union separated from the Baptist Union in England because the Baptist Union downgraded the Bible from being the inspired and authoritative Word of God to being some sort of mere human book. And that was Spurgeon's concern. That's why it's called the downgrade controversy, because they had downgraded the Bible from what it ought to be upheld and perceived as. A friend of Spurgeon, another evangelist, an American evangelist, D.L. Moody, very well known, certainly his Bible Institute there in Chicago that he founded, Moody Bible Institute, Moody Publishers, Moody Church, all associated with D.L. Moody. He was born in Massachusetts. He was raised a Unitarian. When he was 18 years old, he was converted. His Sunday school teacher shared with him about the love of God and the love of Christ, and the Holy Spirit used that gospel message to change his heart. He began ministering then in Chicago, actually planted a church there in Chicago that was burned down during the great Chicago fire. And he was actually deeply impacted by those events. But he ministered in the Chicago area. And of course, you know that because that's where the church and the school are located. Traveled to England in 1872. While he was there, he was promoted by Charles Spurgeon. In fact, when we talked about the modern missions movement, one of the things we pointed out was that Spurgeon had developed the wordless book for cross-cultural evangelism when language is a problem. Moody took that wordless book, actually added the fourth color to the wordless book, the gold that represents heaven, and Moody was the one who popularized the wordless book in America and had a great influence then on the foreign missions movement. When he came back to America from England, he continued to preach to large crowds, sometimes up to 20,000, even President Ulysses S. Grant went and heard D.L. Moody preach. So, just making some connections, I suppose, with American history, but uh, very influential during his lifetime. And then sort of the last of the 19th century revivalists, and you can see he comes into the early 20th century, and in some ways, uh, we have a precedent being laid here by Moody, by others like A.J. Gordon and... Um, some of the guys who are mentioned even in the class notes, all the way up to Billy Sunday, we have a little bit of a precedent being set for Billy Graham and the 20th century revivalistic ministry, uh, the Crusades, that whole concept really comes out of the late 19th century with some of these earlier men. Billy Sunday was a professional baseball player who converted to, uh, who was saved, was converted at the Pacific Garden Missions in Chicago in 1886. A few years later, 1895, he began holding his own revival campaigns. In particular, he targeted large cities. And as a result, he was able to have massive crowds. And at one New York City campaign, this would have been a multi-day, probably multi-week campaign, he claimed that there were 98,000 decisions made for Christ. 
So again, it's, it's representative now of a post-Second Great Awakening decisionistic evangelistic model. Uh, but you can start to see his influence. In fact, Billy Sunday preached to larger crowds than any evangelist before the invention of modern sound amplification. And certainly by the time we get into the 1910s and 1920s, there's some level of sound amplification, but nothing like what we have today. One of the things that characterized Billy Sunday was his strong He was a strong proponent of prohibition. We talked just a little bit about the prohibition movement last time and uh, the 18th Amendment and all of that going on really right around this time period. Billy Sunday was a huge proponent of prohibition. He was a major opponent of alcohol. And uh, when he preached the gospel, he preached a gospel of salvation and also a gospel of sobriety. He's preached against other social sins as well, uh, like dancing and tobacco. And so a little bit of what will come to characterize the fundamentalist movement is these strong moral stands on controversial social issues of the day. And at this time period, tobacco, dancing, and alcohol are the major social issues of the day. Yep, question. Did Moody and Sunday and these guys use the kind of manipulative tactics that Finney did, like with the altar call and all that? Uh, s- certain ones to a greater extent than others. There, there certainly w- were some elements of mechanisms. I mean, even the idea that we're going to go and have a revival campaign, which was Billy Sunday's whole thing, Uh, really was more of a mentality that represents that shift that took place in the Second Great Awakening. Uh, Though with some of these guys, like Moody in particular, I I think there are some criticisms of Moody's ministry, but having said that, I think Moody was more biblical and more balanced, certainly, than a guy like Charles Finney was. So I wouldn't put them in the same category. (coughs) Yep. In particular, to D.L. Moody's ministry, um, yeah, the criticisms that I've seen of Moody's ministry, uh, especially from more of a reformed perspective, would be perhaps in the areas of Reformed theology versus a more Arminian approach to evangelism. That would be one area. And then the other area would be that he was a little bit more broad in his willingness to work with and accept Catholics and other groups. And so a bit more ecumenical in his approach. Which still, I think, is a criticism of some of these popular revivalists even in our own day. Uh, Speaking in particular of Billy Graham, that there would be those who would be very critical of Billy Graham because he's more open to um, Catholics and to liberal Protestants. In fact, that is the reason that fundamentalism has such a big problem with Billy Graham when we get to the 1950s. So those would probably be the two main areas. But, you know, a guy like Charles Spurgeon can be Moody's friend and even promote and support D.L. Moody, even though Spurgeon himself would be very clear on his Reformed theology and very clear on his anti-Catholic stance. I don't know if you've heard, I'm so surprised right about some of our bibliography and on our biographies and stuff like that, was mentioning sometimes how he would almost um, force, like, uh, seemingly in a way to almost like force salvation upon a person um, and trying to bring them to it, where he would hold, hold meetings smaller meetings in particular when he would bring them. It was very much like a forceful throwing upon them of the gospel and like you gotta kneel now, this is gonna happen now and the salvation really happened. Yeah, perhaps uh, perhaps a little bit of maybe some manipulation. Um, and I think that might go back to concerns about a more Arminian uh, perspective on evangelism, taking that to its logical extreme. All right. You can see then that by the end of the 19th century in American Christianity, 
things are looking, in some ways, things are looking really good for what we'll call evangelical Christianity. By evangelical Christianity, I'm using that in a historic sense to simply refer to those who believe the biblical gospel. So, Bible-believing Christianity at the end of the 19th century had a lot of momentum. The Protestant Bible-believing denominations, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, they had all grown exponentially during the 19th century. And there was a great deal of enthusiasm for the gospel during this time period. And I think it's even evidenced at the the way in which those evangelists were able to have unprecedented influence in terms of the crowds of people to whom they were preaching during this time. So for Moody to be able to be preaching to 20,000 people on certain occasions, and for Charles Spurgeon to be preaching weekly, albeit in England, to 5,000 people every week, uh, and, and then even Billy Sunday and others, uh, there's a lot of reason for great enthusiasm on the part of many Christians during this time period. Christianity in America is having a major influence in society as well, and we talked about that last time. A lot of the reason that we think of our nation as a Christian nation has more to do with the influence of Christianity coming out of the Second Great Awakening than it does with any semblance of Christianity that existed among the Founding Fathers. And We mentioned that last time as well. But... There are also some major threats to the gospel that are starting to creep up on the horizon, including, of course, the rise of those cult groups, including now the introduction of Darwinistic evolution. Darwin published his Origin of Species in 1859, and that theory of evolution was gaining major ground, especially among those in rationalistic skeptical circles. Guys like Friedrich Nietzsche and other philosophers were promoting the growth of nihilism and atheism. And suddenly we have sort of an atheistic secularism, which is even replacing the, the deistic humanism of the 18th century. We've already talked about higher criticism and its attack on the authority of Scripture. That was a German thing for a while, but then it became really all of Western Europe, and soon it was over in America as well. The growth of modernism in which science, not God, was exalted as the key to understanding absolute truth. Science and reason became the authority, not revelation. The rise of the social gospel. We've already talked about that as well. The result of all of these things is the undoing now of the mainline denominations as liberalism infiltrates churches and institutions. So there is, at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, a great battle that is about to take place in the American denominations for the control of those American denominations. And the question is, who is going to control the direction of the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Anglican slash Episcopalian Church? Who's going to control those churches? What direction they go in? Is it going to be the modernists who think Christianity needs to be reinvented for a modern 20th century audience? Or is it going to be the Bible-believing Christians who think that the church and Christianity needs to be defined in terms of the historic truth claims of Scripture? That's the question. That's the issue as we come into the 20th century. So, in response to the rise of all of these threats, there are a group of conservative Bible scholars who establish a set of 14 doctrinal principles to outline what they believe is the essence of biblical Christianity. And they do this at the Niagara Bible Conference which was actually a Bible conference, kind of like Shepherd's Conference, in the sense that it met annually for about 25 years, met in New York. Known as the Niagara Creed, these principles laid the foundation for a movement that would later be called fundamentalism. And the fundamentalists, then, are those who hold on to the fundamentals of the faith and are willing to fight against the modernists and the liberals who deny the fundamentals of the faith. 
Um, that's, that's the battle that's taking place. And it's non-denominational, cross-denominational, and so you have dispensationalists like C.I. Schofield at the Niagara Bible Conference, A.C. Dixon, A.C. Gabelin, and others. Then you have folks like B.B. Warfield and J. Gresham Machen and those at Princeton Theological Seminary. One of the things that we didn't really get to highlight as much, though it is, in, again, in the class notes, is that in the 19th century, Princeton Theological Seminary had really stood as the bastion of orthodoxy over against things like the New Haven theology of Nathaniel Taylor and then the New Divinity of Horace Bushnell and the progressive, uh, really the progressive orthodoxy of Horace Bushnell and even the social gospel of Gladden and others Princeton had stood firm. And who was at Princeton? It was guys like Charles Hodge and A.A. A. Hodge and B.B. Warfield and then J. Gresham Machen, some of the great names of American church history. Presbyterian, certainly in their distinctives, but orthodox and willing to fight for the truth against the rise of liberalism. And Machen, you see, included here in these early fundamentalist meetings and discussions. These early fundamentalists came together because of their common commitment to the authority of Scripture and an evangelical understanding of the gospel. I mean, really, it is Reformation principles all over again. I mean, what are the two main principles of the Reformation? Sola Scriptura and Sola Fide. Why? Because Sola Scriptura is the formal principle. It is the principle out of which all doctrine must be formulated. Sola Fide is the material principle because it is the essence and heart of the gospel. That is what defines at the heart who the fundamentalists were. They were those who still believed that the Bible is the authority and that the gospel described in Scripture is the true gospel. Uh, questions arose as we get into the early 20th century about whether or not these Bible-believing Christians should stay in their mainline denominations because the mainline denominations are starting to, starting to capitulate to modernism or whether these Bible-believing Christians ought to separate from their mainline denominations as the denominations go liberal. So in England, for example, as the Baptist Union is starting to go more and more liberal, Charles Spurgeon decides that he must separate from the Baptist Union. That's a question that a lot of American Christians are starting to ask themselves at this time as well. When the Northern Baptists start to go liberal, do I stay a Northern Baptist or do I leave the Northern Baptist denomination and start a new denomination like the GARBC or the CBA? both of which came out of the American Baptists. This issue of separation eventually became the defining mark of the fundamentalist movement and is generally what separates contemporary fundamentalists from contemporary evangelicals, and we'll talk more about that as we go through. So, using the example of Spurgeon and the downgrade controversy in England, here's Spurgeon summarizing why he felt he had to leave. He says this, whether others do so or not, I have felt the power of the text come out from among them and be ye separate. That's from 2 Corinthians 6. And have quitted, in other words, I've left, both the Baptist Union and Association once for all. This is forced upon me not only by my convictions, but also by the experience of the utter uselessness of of attempting to deal with the evil except by personally coming out from it. So there you have Spurgeon explaining why he left the Baptist Union. He felt as if he was forced out. When they downgraded Scripture, he left. And, uh, but there were other fundamentalists who felt like they should try and stay in to see if they could somehow regain control of these liberal denominations as this downward shift was taking place. Yep? How exactly did they downplay Scripture or downgrade Scripture? Yeah, they deny the doctrine of inerrancy. That's really where it began. So they deny the doctrine of inerrancy. Now there's errors in the Bible that cast aspersion on the doctrine of inspiration because could this really have come from God if there's errors in it? And from there, the whole thing falls apart very quickly. 
Spurgeon again says, Numbers of good brothers in different ways remain in fellowship with those who are undermining the gospel. And they talk of their conduct as though it were a loving course, which the Lord will approve of in the day of his appearing. We cannot understand them. The bounden duty of a true believer towards men who profess to be Christians and yet deny the word of the Lord and reject the fundamentals of the gospel is to come out from among them. If it be said that effort should be made to produce reform, we agree with the remark. But when you know that they will be useless, what is the use? I love that line of reasoning. Where the basis of association allows error and almost invites it, and there is an evident determination not to alter that basis, nothing remains to be done inside which can be of any radical service. Complicity with error will take from the best of men the power to enter any successful protest against it. Our present sorrowful protest is not a matter of this man or that, this error or that, but of principle. Now you'll notice that Spurgeon is writing that in the year 1888, This is about 40 years or so before these same types of decisions are being made by American fundamentalists. And that's pretty typical. Things in Europe tend to precede, theological developments in Europe tend to precede theological developments here in the U.S. by about 50 years or so. And we see that even with the capitulation of the mainline denominations to liberalism uh, during this time period. But here's what Spurgeon's saying. He's saying, look, the denominations are going liberal. So the ship is sinking. You're on the Titanic and the ship is sinking. It's going down. The question is, at what point do you jump ship and get in a lifeboat and save yourself and those who you have the ability to save? And Spurgeon's saying, I got to jump ship now because I see what's happening. And he says, there's other good men who are still on the boat and they think staying on the boat is a loving thing to do. Spurgeon is saying, but eventually you can't stay on the boat anymore. At some point, you have to come out and separate yourself. Okay, So that idea of separation is a decision that a lot of Christians are being forced to make at this time period. And the fundamentalists in particular will come to view that separation as being vitally important to their own identity as faithful Christians. All right, so the Niagara Creed, we discussed briefly, and we'll read a little bit of it here in a moment. Also during this time, there's conflicts within Presbyterian circles, especially at Presbyterian seminaries. The Presbyterian movement, because of its hierarchical church structure, actually holds heresy trials, where they put seminary professors on trial and defrock them, including Charles Briggs, Henry P. Smith and A.C. McGifford. And the issue in each case is that these guys are starting to deny inerrancy. And when they deny inerrancy, they are removed. And as late as 1910, the American General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church passes what is called the Doctrinal Deliverance of 1910, and they list five points of doctrine that they assert, define biblical Christianity or Bible-believing, faithful, orthodox Christians. And those five points become known in church history as the five fundamentals. And we'll look at those in just a moment. Here's the Niagara Bible Conference Creed of 1878. Uh, We believe that the world will not be converted during the present dispensation. This, by the way, was a dispensational conference but is fast ripening for judgment while there will be a fearful apostasy in the professing Christian body. And that was more or less a reference to liberalism. And hence that the Lord Jesus will come in person to introduce the millennial age when Israel shall be restored to their own land and the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. And that this personal and premillennial advent is the blessed hope set before us in the gospel for which we should be constantly looking By the way, Niagara Bible Conference included not only premillennial Baptists and premillennial independents, there were premillennial Presbyterians. I know that sounds so oxymoronic, but um, anyway, we don't have time to get into all that history. The point we're focusing on here is the fundamentals of the gospel. Here are the 14 points of the Niagara Creed, the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures, the Trinity, creation. So it's inerrancy of scripture, not the modernists, uh, the trinity, not the rationalistic Unitarianism, 
uh, creation, not Darwinian evolution. These are not only biblical historic doctrines, but they are directly set up in response to the attacks of liberalism. Uh, spiritual death from Adam, necessity of a new birth, redemption by the blood of Christ, salvation by faith alone, assurance of salvation, centrality of Christ, and so on and so forth. These 14 points start to give sort of an early creedal definition to what fundamentalism will become. And then here's the five points. These are more famous, but they come later, 1910, the five-point deliverance. And really, these five points come to define who fundamentalists are. The fundamentalists are those who believe these five things. The inerrancy of Scripture, the virgin birth and deity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement through God's grace and human faith, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the authenticity of Jesus' miracles. You say, well, why those five things? Why are those five chosen as the five fundamentals? Well, certainly we would say that the inerrancy of Scripture, the incarnation, substitutionary atonement, and the resurrection, those are all cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. But why is miracles added onto this? Do you have to believe in miracles? Is that a cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith? The reason why miracles is included is because it is a direct affirmation of supernaturalism over against the naturalism that characterized the attack of modernism. So the modernists said naturalism precludes miracles, and the fundamentalists said, no, we believe the Bible. The Bible presents a worldview in which God intervenes in human history. That is a supernatural precedent. Therefore, we affirm the reality of miracles. So affirming the, the authenticity of miracles was a direct stance against the naturalistic, rational skepticism of the modernists. And certainly we would see it as a, <laughs> a clear extension of if you believe that the Bible is inerrant, you have to believe in miracles. So it is a necessary outgrowth of the first fundamental. So scripture is our authority, scripture is inspired, scripture is inerrant. Christ is who he claimed to be. He is the incarnate Son of God. Therefore, the virgin birth must have happened. And he died as the substitutionary atonement for sin, not just as a good moral example like the liberals claimed. And he rose bodily from the grave. And his miracles are real miracles. And then some fundamentalists would add for that fifth one that Christ is going to return and his return is imminent. I don't know if you guys remember, you probably don't, but way back early on in first semester, we read from Irenaeus when Irenaeus was talking about the tradition of the apostles, and he gives this outline of what the tradition of the apostles consisted of, and it is almost identical to the five fundamentals of the faith, which is pretty cool to uh, see the the connections that the fundamentalists had in going back really to an, an apostolic, biblical, early church understanding of what the fundamentals of the faith were. Ironically, of course, in, I mean, the word fundamentalist didn't exist in, uh, in American vocabulary. Uh, well, let me, tell, let me explain this first, and then we'll talk about the, the term itself. From 1910 to 1915, we had a series of authors from all the major denominations, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, and Independents, uh, who wrote a series of essays and articles that were published together in what is called the Fundamentals. And you can still buy the Fundamentals off of CBD. It's a great set of really helpful articles. And they dealt with the major issues at which Christianity was getting attacked. So things like liberal theology, higher criticism, Roman Catholicism, socialism, cults, Darwinian evolution. And uh, so these men wrote in these series of articles, and they were called the fundamentals. And so that's where the name really arises, is that the fundamentalists are the ones who embraced the fundamentals, the five points of doctrine, and who were characterized by these books that were being written, these essays called the Fundamentals. And it was a guy named Curtis Lee Laws, 
who first coined the term fundamentalist and applied it to Christians who believed and were willing to fight for the fundamentals of the faith. What's, what's kind of interesting about the term fundamentalist is it didn't exist until the 1920s when it was first coined. And when it was first coined, it, it referred only to Bible-believing Christians. That's what the word fundamentalist meant. So I think it's so ironic. I mean, we're less than 100 years later. The word fundamentalist today, in most people's minds, causes them to think probably of an Islamic radical or extremist. But the word historically has nothing to do with Islam. It has nothing to do with extremism. It has only to do with Christians who embrace the fundamentals of the Christian faith. So there is no such thing as an Islamic fundamentalist in the historic understanding of what the word fundamentalist actually means. But it's been co-opted and hijacked by a popular culture and is turned into something that it never historically meant. I want to just read a couple sections from the fundamentals. Here's some of the authors, Philip Morrow, and I'm just trying to highlight their view of Scripture because that's something I've tried to highlight at every turn in this class because I think church history teaches us that we need to have a high view of Scripture if we're going to stay faithful to what it is that God's called us to do. Philip Morrow says this, The living word shall continue to be the discerning champion of all who resort to it for the help which is not to be had elsewhere in this world of the dying. In going to the Bible, we never think of ourselves as going back to a book of the distant past, to a thing of antiquity, but we go to it as to a book of the present, a living book. And so indeed it is, living in the power of an endless life and able to build us up and to give us an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. You can hear he is defending Scripture over against modernists and liberals who are saying, oh, that's, a, that's an ancient, outdated book. We need a modern form of Christianity for a modern world. And the fundamentalists are saying, hey, it's not an outdated book. It's a living book. It is the Word of God. A.C. Dixon. I like this. He said, Luther said that he studied the Bible as he gathered apples. First he shook the whole tree that the ripest might fall. Then he climbed the tree and shook each limb. And when he had shaken each limb, he shook each branch. And after each branch, every twig. And then looked under each leaf. Let us search the Bible as a whole. Shake the whole tree. Read it as rapidly as you would any other book. Then shake every limb, studying book after book. Then shake every branch, giving attention to the chapters when they do not break the sense. Then shake every twig by careful study of the paragraphs and sentences. And you will be rewarded if you will look under every leaf by searching the meaning of the words. That's really just a great illustration of expositional preaching and exegetical study. And then one more, George Pentecost. He says, We know not the day nor the hour when the Lord will come or call us hence, and we want to be ready both as to purity of character and the courtly culture of the heavenly city. We wish to be familiar with the history of redemption and with the mysteries of the kingdom. We should not want to appear as an awkward stranger in our Father's house of light. We can only get this sanctification of character and culture of life and manner by constant familiarity and communion with God and the saints through the Word. The Word of God is a chart that marks all the rocks and reefs in the sea of life. If we heed it and sail our frail bark by it, we shall come safely into the haven of rest. It's a constant theme throughout the fundamentalists, throughout the fundamentals, that we have to go back to the Bible as our only authority for life and doctrine. It's not surprising, right? That's, that was the theme of the Reformers. That was the theme of the evangelical revivalists in the First Great Awakening. It's the theme now of the fundamentalists, just as it is a theme of all evangelical Christians throughout all of church history, going all the way back through the church fathers to the time of the apostles the authority of Scripture, and living our lives in light of that authority. So that, that is what defines the fundamentalists, is they are the Christians who are committed to the Bible at a time when the Bible is under attack by people who think it's outdated. So then those who espouse the five fundamentalists and consider them worth fighting for are deemed fundamentalists. And so Curtis Lee Laws in The Watchman Examiner is the first to coin this term on July 1st, 1920, when he says that we suggest 
that those who still cling to the great fundamentals and who mean to do battle royale for the fundamentals shall be called fundamentalists. And so in the 1920s and 30s then, the massive conflict really heats up in the American context where the mainline denominations battle for control of the mainline denominations is being fought between those who believe the Bible and those who want a Christianity that is no longer governed by Scripture. Not surprisingly, evolution versus biblical creationism is at the heart of this whole controversy. Uh, That's certainly a massive part of it. We still have, even within evangelical circles, this being a major issue that people are wrestling through. Uh, In 1925, a Tennessee science teacher named John T. Scopes was put on trial for teaching evolution in a public school. So if you can imagine it, the public school system before 1925 did not allow evolution to be taught in the classroom. And uh, it was the ACLU who essentially challenged that law by promising to defend in court any teacher who would be willing to break the law by teaching evolution. And John T. Scopes did, and it was a very big public trial a public trial in which a famous defense attorney named Clarence Darrow faced off against a very famous prosecutor, actually a presidential candidate at one point, William Jennings Bryant, who was also a Presbyterian. He was a fundamentalist. And so this trial over whether or not this biology teacher in Tennessee could teach evolution in his class essentially became, in the court of American public opinion, a trial between modernism and fundamentalism. The fundamentalists were trying to keep the modernists out of the classroom, that's the way it was perceived, and the modernists were trying to fight for their civil liberties. So Lisa Miller in Newsweek says this, this is from a 2006 article, The fundamentalist proposition was put to a very public test when the American Civil Liberties Union hired an unremarkable science teacher named John Scopes to teach the theory of evolution in a public school. Scopes was arrested, and the ACLU hired Clarence Darrow to defend him. The fundamentalists hired none other than the great populist presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan. Darrow routed Bryan. Well, that's not quite accurate. In the court of public opinion, he did. Brian actually won the trial, Uh, but even though the fundamentalists won the trial, they lost the public opinion of American society in the process. So beaten, at least in the court of public opinion, the fundamentalists went back to their homes and their Bibles. The defeat raised an important issue. Who is an insider and who is an outsider? Before the Scopes trial, the fundamentalists had been the insiders in the mainline American denominations. But after Scopes, Evangelicals felt a chill from America's elites, and the culture warmed only slowly over the middle decades of the century as Billy Graham rose to prominence. That's a pretty broad survey, and it's coming from Newsweek, so it's being written by somebody who maybe doesn't understand all the nuances. But Douglas Sweeney, writing in Christianity Today, also in 2006, I think provides a really helpful survey of this whole issue. So I want to read to you just a little bit of what Sweeney wrote. And um, this will be about five slides worth, so hang in there with me. But this explains the whole context, and I think it's really important for you to understand. During the late 19th century, most of the mainline Protestant churches struggled to cope with the rise of modernism, which favored adaptation to modern views and trends along with scientific naturalism, higher biblical criticism, and spiritual apathy. Hundreds of thousands of evangelicals left the large denominations, forming smaller churches to combat the sins of the age. The vast majority of evangelicals, however, stayed with the main line and tried to purify their churches from within. By the early 1910s, they formed a massive cross-denominational movement for reform based on a common acclamation of the fundamental or cardinal doctrines of Christianity. 
The most popular list was the five-point deliverance of the Northern Presbyterians. The 1910 Presbyterian General Assembly ruled that all who wanted to be ordained within their ranks had to affirm the Westminster Confession and subscribe to five fundamental doctrines. And we've already read those five fundamentals. At roughly the same time, A.C. Dixon, R.A. Torrey, Torrey, by the way, was the guy who preached in Moody Church after D.L. Moody died, and several other luminaries published 12 volumes of essays called The Fundamentals, A Testimony to the Truth. The books, which were mailed to ministers and missionaries around the world, opposed all kinds of modernism, from higher biblical criticism to theological liberalism, from naturalism to Darwinianism to democratic socialism. Building on the monument of the northern on the momentum of the Northern Presbyterians, they rallied people from different Protestant traditions to a least common denominator flag of orthodoxy. So here are the things you have to believe. By the late 1910s, the conservatives entrenched along the Protestant mainline were poised for battle in defense of the fundamentals. The Interdenominational World Christian Fundamentals Association, heavily influenced by premillennial dispensationalism, gathered conservatives for whom mainline apostasy was a sign of the coming Great Tribulation. With eschatological urgency, it reinforced the resolve of anxious evangelical leaders to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. In a 1920 editorial published in his Northern Baptist paper, Curtis Lee Laws referred to these evangelicals as fundamentalists. He deemed the name a badge of honor. During the early 1920s, battles ensued in nearly every mainline Protestant body between the fundamentalists and those who wanted to remain tolerant and open-minded in response to modern learning. The fundamentalists were defeated in almost every case. This, by the way, is why the mainline denominations are liberal. The only exception that I know of is the Southern Baptists. And the Southern Baptist denomination was largely a recovery effort after it started to go liberal and then was rescued. Yep. Quick question about defeat. How do they quantify defeat? Defeat in the sense that the, the leadership and control of the denomination fell into the hands of of leaders and of churches that denied the fundamentals of the faith. And so as a result, the entire denomination went in a liberal direction, and the fundamentalists, for the most part, left and started new denominations. So new schools were started, new denominations were started. For example, J. Gresham Machen, when he leaves Princeton, he gets kicked out of Princeton because Princeton goes liberal. He goes and starts a new seminary, Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. And he starts a new denomination, he started the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the OPC, which is the fundamentalist uh, result of the PCUSA going liberal. So a lot of the schools that you guys would be familiar with, uh, schools like Talbot and Biola, schools like Wheaton, schools like Dallas Theological Seminary, these are really turn-of-the-century fundamentalist schools that are started largely as a reaction to modernism and liberalism. Now, we're going to have a new set of schools started in the 1940s and 50s when we get to the neo-evangelical or new evangelical wave. That's going to be Fuller Seminary and Trinity Seminary and some, and some others. Gordon Conwell. Uh, those are evangelical schools, and that's coming a little bit later. So they lost control then of the mainline denominations and the varied ministries, they lost control of mainline colleges and theological seminaries. So most of them withdrew, forming their own separate ministries. Many began to advocate second degree separation, and that's what we're going to talk about here in a moment. Separation not only from sin, worldliness, and apostasy, but also from other Christians who stood too close to those things themselves. Nothing symbolized their defeat more powerfully than the Scopes Monkey Trial held in Dayton, Tennessee in the summer of 1925. Then he goes on to describe this. Then he says there, fundamentalists won the case, at least temporarily. It actually got overturned on a technicality. But they were ridiculed by Darrow and the press. Despite their intellectual rigor and strength in northern urban areas, the fundamentalists have been portrayed ever since as country bumpkins. And that is the way that American popular culture perceived fundamentalism after 1925. And so that, that ends uh, Sweeney's survey of what, what happened during this time period. 
Cameron. I noticed that, but I'm just reading Olsen's book. I don't, I don't think Olsen even mentioned that they won. The way he portrays it is like they lost to this morning. Well, I'm just, I can't remember for sure. I don't know exactly where Olsen would be. Um, I can. They did win the case. Uh, but then it got overturned on some sort of technicality. And I'm not exactly sure what the details were, but ultimately uh, John T. Scopes was fined. I think he was fined $100 or something like that. But then it got overturned. Uh, the reality is, <clears throat> um, so he didn't have to pay the fine. And, and then eventually those laws, the Butler Law, which was the thing that outlawed uh, the teaching of evolutionary science, at least in the state of Tennessee and some other states, uh, those laws eventually get repealed, and now, of course, we're in a time when evolutionary science is the only thing that's taught in public school. So, from that standpoint, it is significant. From our perspective today, we're focusing more on the outcome for fundamentalism in terms of the way it was perceived in American culture. Fundamentalism, evangelical Christianity, in a historic, broad sense, evangelical Christianity had great influence in society in the late 19th century. They were the insiders. They were the ones controlling the mainline denominations. And suddenly, in the early part of the 20th century, they find themselves on the outside looking in. They're now the, they've now been castigated as socially, culturally, and probably most importantly, intellectually backwards. And fundamentalists... Uh, found themselves bristling against the fact that a country they once felt that they influenced and even directed in some senses, now they've been really rejected. Uh, that's part of the motivation behind the rise of new evangelicalism. The new evangelicals felt like the fundamentalists were too backwards and they wanted to have more influence in culture and society. So they started a new organization. Yeah, Aaron. Um. Regarding the Vincentian rule in the 5th century, what sort of similarities and differences do you see with the new kind of fundamentalist, kind of what everybody should believe kind of a thing, regarding how it was what everybody has believed at, at all times? Do you remember what I'm talking about? Well, I don't know about direct connections to that particular part of church history, but I think what the fundamentalists were trying to do is, in light of what they felt was an overwhelming attack from every, uh, from all of these different angles in broader society, philosophically, culturally, socially, intellectually, uh, Christianity is under attack. And so the idea was, we are going to batten down the hatches a little bit, we're going to identify what are the core doctrines of Christianity. And we're going to then mount some sort of unified defensive, cross-denominational, but a unified defensive against the advances of error. And uh, so, uh, so they, I mean, they looked back to their New Testaments and to their Bibles to identify what those fundamental doctrines are. All right, fundamentalists then begin to lose control of the mainline denominations. And so here Michael Canham says this, eventually, however, many fundamentalists realized that they could not purge out the sin from their denominations, and so they left. They withdrew to establish new fellowships. Examples from this era include the exodus of Presbyterian conservatives under J. Gresham Machen from Princeton to found Westminster in 1929, along with the subsequent establishment of the OPC. And also around this time, we have the birth of the General Association of Regular Baptists under the leadership of Robert Ketchum. And uh, actually, the, the Master's College uh, started just a few years after that. It is a historically a GARBC school, and it was originally called Los Angeles Baptist College. Uh, so these colleges are starting because the, the colleges that Christian kids used to go to uh, they can't go to anymore because those colleges and universities have gone liberal. They've modernized, to use a philosophical term. By the 1940s, ecclesiastical separatism then was increasingly becoming a distinctive mark of fundamentalism, and the unity that had characterized the early years of the movement had been replaced by factionalism even among 
fundamentalists. Uh, let's see, do I have... Yeah, actually this is an important slide for me to read. Kevin Bowder was the president for many years at Central Theological um, Seminary in Minneapolis. And he still teaches there, though he's no longer serving as the president. But uh, that's a fundamentalist seminary. And he says this about the history of that movement. From the very emergence of fundamentalism as a distinguishable movement, attitude was always the thing that set fundamentalists apart from other evangelicals. The fundamentalists not only believed the fundamentals as others did, but they were willing to do battle royale. And he took that quote from Curtis Lee Law's description. That battle took two forms. First, there was a genuine intellectual struggle for the ideas. Second, and more visibly, there was a power struggle for the control of Christian institutions. Fundamentalism had always been characterized by a determination that Christians cannot make common cause with apostates in the work of the Lord. For example, Machen was not content with the mere affirmation of the fundamentals. He sought to get the liberals out of the PCUSA, and failing to do that, he established new institutions like the OPC. Machen's most bitter enemies, this is important, were not the liberals. They were the people whom he called indifferentists. Indifferentists believed the fundamentals, but they were decidedly not fundamentalists. They were the orthodox believers who wanted to keep organizational peace, and so they made peace with the liberals and stayed in the mainline denominations. All right, the indifferentists believed the fundamentals, but they could not fellowship with people who did, but they could fellowship, excuse me, with people who did not. When Machen left Princeton, it was not because Princeton had become liberal, it had not, it was because Princeton had become indifferentist. People like Ross Stevens and Charles Erdman taught the fundamentals, but they objected to the bad manners of Machen and others who attempted to expel liberals from the denomination. All right, so the issue within fundamentalism becomes an issue with regard to the application of separation. So if we have the mainline denominations, and the mainline denominations include Bible-believing Christians, and it also starts to include liberal Christians, well, eventually we have uh, the liberals... Gaining control, liberal Christians. So we're talking about liberal theology here. The fundamentalists they separate from the mainline denominations because the liberal Christians begin to control those mainline denominations. But there's another group that's still within the mainline denominations called the indifferentists, or at least that's what Machen called them. The indifferentists believe the fundamentals But they don't separate from liberals and from the liberal denominations. Okay, so there's, there's three groups here. There are the Bible-believing Christians who separate from the mainline denominations. Then there are the people in the denominations who don't believe the Bible at all, liberal Christians. And then there are these indifferentists who want to maintain peace within the denominations. So they don't want to leave. They refuse to separate even though they still believe the fundamentals of the faith. The question then becomes, for the fundamentalists, after they separate, they know how they're going to interact with the liberals. They're not going to interact with the liberals. But the question is, how do they interact with the indifferentists? So, how do I, as a fundamentalist who has separated, let's say, from my Baptist denomination... How do I, as a fundamentalist who's separated from a denomination, how do I now view other people who I know to be believers, but who are still in that mainline denomination? 
Going back to Charles Spurgeon, right? If I'm, I know the Titanic is sinking, I'm in the lifeboat, how now do I interact with people who I know to be good men, but who are still on the Titanic and choosing to stay on there because they think that's the most loving and gracious thing to do? That becomes the big question of separation within the fundamentalist movement. And this, by the way, this fundamentalist separation from liberal Christians is what becomes known as primary separation. Okay, Primary separation is the separation between a Christian and an apostate, or a believer and an unbeliever. That's primary separation. Secondary separation is this, is separating from people who don't separate from the liberals. So secondary separation is... The, indiffer- the indifferentists did not practice primary separation. Therefore, the fundamentalists said we, we need to separate from these people as well. That's secondary separation. So primary separation is I separate from apostates and unbelievers. Secondary separation is I separate from people who don't apply primary separation the way I think they should. And the fundamentalists won't be agreed on how to apply secondary separation. It's also sometimes called ecclesiastical separation. This is a big issue in the 1930s and 40s, a really big issue. It's still a big issue in some circles today, especially in contemporary fundamentalist circles. So we had separation applied in different ways. There were people who applied separation in local relationships while remaining in national organizations that included liberals. So I'm not going to partner with any liberal churches in my immediate area, but I'm still going to belong to a denomination that has largely gone liberal. Those were some. There were then those who separated from liberal denominations, but fellowshiped still with the indifferentists, the conservatives who stayed in those denominations. So I'm not going to be part officially, but I'm still going to fellowship with people who are, are still a part. Then there was separation from liberal denominations and from all those who would not separate from them. That really was where I think traditionally fundamentalism mainly ended up in the practice of secondary separation in addition to primary separation. And then there was more extremely separation from everyone except those of one's own denominational affiliation. And there certainly would be some of those strict separatists in fundamentalist circles today. Okay, so primary separation is separation from liberals, unbelievers. Um, In in our context, we would say, well, primary separation would be, for example, and and here's, I'll just end class with this since we're down to the last four minutes. This was really the lightning rod for fundamentalists, was the rise of Billy Graham in the 1950s. And I know we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but we'll finish this up on Thursday. Billy Graham is an example of an indifferentist from using Machen's term, right? Billy Graham actually grew up in fundamentalist circles. The fundamentalists had very high hopes for Billy Graham because they thought he was going to be kind of that that way to regain some of that influence within culture and within society like they had had with guys like Billy Sunday and with D.L. Moody and with others in the past, in the history of fundamentalism. So Billy Graham was sort of the poster boy for fundamentalism growing up. But in the 1950s, at a crusade in New York, Billy Graham made the strategic decision to include liberal Protestants in his evangelistic crusade. And since then, also to include Roman Catholics and others in some of his crusades. The fundamentalists saw this as a major problem. So Billy Graham is one who believes the fundamentals of the faith, but who does not separate from liberals and other unorthodox groups. He is the very definition of an indifferentist. And the fundamentalists had to ask themselves the question, how then do we treat Billy Graham? Do we fellowship with Billy Graham? Do we work with Billy Graham? Do we partner with Billy Graham when his crusades come to town? Or do we reject Billy Graham, distance ourselves from Billy Graham, and separate from him? Most fundamentalists chose the latter. They chose to separate from Billy Graham. Why? Because Billy Graham did not practice and apply primary separation. 
in the way that the fundamentalists believe that he should. Does that make sense? So he was an indifferentist. He, in fact, is the most polarizing of the indifferentists when it comes to the fundamentalist movement. And still today, uh, you have then not only primary separation, but you'll have secondary separation, and then you'll have degrees of separation. And just to give you an example, um, Rick Holland, who was on staff here for many years was at one point invited to come speak at a fundamentalist um, fundamentalist youth event I think would be the best way to describe it and there was another man who was invited to come and speak at that same event who was the president of a fundamentalist college at the time and when that individual heard that Rick Holland was going to be coming he withdrew from the conference and no longer agreed to participate as a speaker And the reasoning was, because Rick Holland was on staff at John MacArthur's church, and because John MacArthur invited Al Mohler to the Shepherds Conference, and because Al Mohler had partnered with Billy Graham in a crusade in Louisville probably 20 years ago, and because Billy Graham doesn't separate from apostates, ergo, Rick Holland is taboo. So that's when you get degrees of separation. So first degree, second degree, third degree. Now, most fundamentalists don't speak in terms of degrees, but it is a helpful way for us to think about it. So when you hear somebody say sixth or fifth or fourth degree separation, that's what they're talking about. Really, though, it comes down to primary separation, which is separation from apostates, secondary separation, which is the question of how do you interact with other true believers who don't apply primary separation the way that you think they should.